in 2 Chronicles chapter number 18, I want to look at the beginning of the chapter, this interaction that takes place between the king of Judah, who is Jehoshaphat, and then also the king of Israel, and is Ahab. Look at uh, verse number 1 in chapter 18. It reads, Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance, and joined affinity with Ahab. And after certain years, he went down to Ahab to Samaria. That's the capital of Israel. And Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance and for the people that he had with him and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramath Gilead. Now, one thing, this is off topic, but uh, I believe it's Proverbs chapter number 23 is a, uh, a citation where we are warned about to consider diligently what is put before thee. It specifically says what the ruler puts before thee. It tells you, be not desirous of his dainty meats. It says, for it is deceitful meat. And the reason why is because he's trying to persuade you of something. This is a perfect example of that. And it's totally off topic, but Ahab calls him down to him. Of course, Ahab, as far as his character, is an extremely wicked man. He's married unto Jezebel, who is a very wicked woman, and persuades him to do wickedness. Now, we see Jehoshaphat, and if you're not familiar with Jehoshaphat, the Bible is very clear that he was a righteous man. He's the, he, he came after Asa, who was a righteous man. The Bible actually tells you that he walked in the ways of Asa and did that which is right in the sight of the Lord. So, Jehoshaphat is a righteous man. When God looks at him, he considers him to be uh, living a life that is right in his sight. Ahab, not at all. Ahab is a very wicked man. He invites him down because they had already joined an affinity with one another. So they, they, they have a league together, a band together. He invites him down to Israel. And he puts all of this meat before him because it's deceitful meat. And it says that he persuaded him. Look there at the end. And persuaded him to go up with him. Ramoth Gilead. Now, does it sound like Jehoshaphat, as far as his disposition, when he showed up, did it sound like he wanted to go? It doesn't, does it? Because it says that he, you wouldn't have to persuade someone of something if they were already in agreement with you. That means that he wasn't sure, he wasn't on, you know, on, you know, he wasn't fully on board immediately. So he persuaded him to go with him. Then it says in verse 3, And Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. Now, if you were paying attention in the chapter here where Brother Russell was reading through, you would have noticed that they go to war, don't they? And what happens is they end up being put in the heat of the battle, and they end up losing. And particularly Ahab ends up dying. He ends up getting shot, and they almost kill Jehoshaphat. And what's the reason? This is very interesting. Because they mis mistook him for being Ahab. That's the reason why he shouldn't have joined in affinity with him in the first place. That's a perfect example of you shouldn't have been there. If they thought that you were this other wicked person, it's you know, him being an accomplice, right? It's, a, it's, it's a, an ideal example of that. Where he almost died because he was with a wicked person and they thought you were that wicked person. Now, of course, it's a perfect example of that. So he shouldn't have been there in the first place. Jehoshaphat actually gets free. He gets loose. He gets away, right? And it says that the Lord led him away. But I want you to, I want to pick up here in 2 Chronicles chapter number 19, verse number 1. With that in mind, understanding, of course, he shouldn't have been there with Ahab. He's very wicked. Uh, he was a wicked man, and he should not have been joining together with him. Look at verse number 1. It says, And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. So he was spared. Again, this is 2 Chronicles 19. Now look at verse 2. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him. And said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Now here what we're reading about, of course, is his affinity that he made or his league that he went into with Ahab, right? And he's telling him that Ahab is a man that hates the Lord. Should you help the ungodly? And that's what he did. He went forth to help him in battle. And love them that hate the Lord. Should you love Ahab who hates God? And then it says, because you have done that, therefore is wrath upon thee from the Lord. So he's being punished for this. And of course we see this teaching even in the New Testament where it tells us 
Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And it tells you, for what righteousness, for what um, uh, communion hath light with darkness? And then it goes on and on, talking about the, uh, Christ with Belial and the temple of God with idols, right? We shouldn't have anything to do with it. So he knew that this was wrong in the first place. That's why he had to persuade him to go forth with him. Now he comes back afterwards, and then we see that the man of God, Jehu, the seer, the son of Hanani, comes to him and rebukes him and tells him that there's going to be wrath upon you from before the Lord thy God. Now, I want you to consider the, re the, the possible repercussions of the situation previous to this anyway. He almost dies, right, because of his stupid decision that he had made to go forth and yoke up with this wicked man to begin with. Now, afterwards, he's leaving in peace, and Jehu comes to him and rebukes him for the sin that he had committed. I want you to skip forward now to 2 Chronicles chapter number 20. 2 Chronicles chapter number 20. I want you to look with me at... We'll read to get the context and some of the information that I mentioned a moment ago. That's mentioned here at the end of the chapter. Look at verse 31. It says this. And Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah. He was 30 and 5 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 20 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Azubah the daughter of Shilhai, and he walked in the way of Asa, his father, and departed not from it, doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. So again, we can see he's a righteous man. Keep reading there in verse number 33. Uh, Howbeit the high places were not taken away, for as yet the people had not prepared their hearts unto the God of their fathers. Verse 34. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Jehu, the son of Hanani, who is mentioned in the book of the kings of Israel. Verse 35. And after this did Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, join himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who did very wickedly. Now Ahaziah, of course, reigned after Ahab. A, uh, he is the son of Ahab. Ahaziah came after Ahab. And notice what it says here in verse number 35. And after this did Jehoshaphat, king of Ju Judah, join himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who did very wickedly. So Ahab ends up dying, who is a very wicked man, and he brings forth his son, who ends up reigning on his throne, Ahaziah. And of course, you, uh, as you would expect, his son is wicked as well. And you know what? Uh, um, Jehoshaphat ends up doing? Jehoshaphat ends up doing the exact same thing that he did before. He doesn't learn from the man of God. When the man of God comes to him, rebukes him, and tell, and he almost died in the first place, but even after that, the man of God comes to him and tells him, shouldst thou, help them, uh, shouldst thou love them that hate the Lord? And what, does he listen to him? No, he doesn't. He doesn't take heed to you know, the rebuke, to the rebuke proof. What does he do? He ends up bringing forth a son, Ahab that is, that's just as wicked as him. And he goes and makes a league with him as well. Look at verse number 36. It tells us, And he joined himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish. And they made the ships in Zion Heber. And then verse 37, we'll read quickly. This will become relevant later. Then Eliezer, the son of Dodabah, of Merisha prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because thou hast joined thyself with Ahaziah, the Lord hath broken thy works, and the ships were broken, that they were not able to go to Tarshish. The title of the sermon this morning is Learning from Your Mistakes. Learning from Your Mistakes. Not making the same mistakes over and over and over again. Now, here we have a perfect example of that. Where a man goes forth and he commits a sin. When he commits the sin, he, he almost receives the inherent punishment that comes with sin. The wages of sin, right? Can possibly be death. But there's also other wages of sin throughout our life where you just receive an immediate punishment. Saved believers especially, right? Where you can be punished immediately from God. Not always are you punished immediately. Sometimes, you know, uh, uh, the punishment will tarry oftentimes throughout the Bible. And, 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 and in our lives we can see this as well. But we as Christians need to be growing, we need to be progressing in our Christian walk and in our spiritual lives, and we need to, to do so, you have to learn from your mistakes. This is an ideal example of someone that did not learn from their mistakes. Now when I say mistakes, this could be very vague in some areas, but then of course this can be very uh, clear and uh, specific. It can be just general sins that are in your life, 
Work can be what we think of as just foolish decisions. Now, the Bible says, keep this in mind, that the thought of foolishness is sin. So doing something foolish or thinking something foolish is a sin as well. Just making a bad decision that's not necessarily what we would think of as a major transgression against the Lord. All of that is going to apply in this particular sermon. This right here, what we see uh, Jehoshaphat doing and committing a sin by yoking up with someone after he's clearly rebuked for what he had done previous is a major sin. It's not something small. It's not something minor. God goes so far as to send a prophet with a specific message to go to him and to warn him, and he almost died in the first place. And then what ends up happening is he yokes up with his son afterwards. He did not learn from his mistake. He did exactly what he was rebuked for. He did exactly what he was corrected on. He went back and did the exact same thing once more. This, of course, is something that we need to try to refrain from in our lives. We need to learn from the mistakes that we have. I want you to go and turn with me into Genesis chapter number 20, verse number 1. Genesis chapter number 20, verse number 1. <clears throat> now, what I want to begin uh, with right now in Genesis 20, and I'm also going to read to you from 1 Corinthians 10, is the concept that you know what's better than learning from your own mistakes is learning from other people's mistakes. That's best. That's what you would prefer to do. That's what you would rather do is not have to make the mistake yourself, but rather... Look at someone else that has already made that mistake. Look at the examples in the Bible and don't go down the same path that they go down. Learn from other people's mistakes. This is what you would prefer. This is what you should do is learn from others' mistakes, other people's mistakes, and not have to commit the same mistake yourself and then learn from that. Because oftentimes, there, it, there are punishments that come with sin that will be with you forever. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 11 says this. Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now that particularly in context is speaking of the children of Israel uh, rising up and committing fornication uh, when they made the golden calf and all of that. So we see that the Old Testament, all the examples of the sin that, that men had committed or men have committed in the Old Testament... Those were written so that we can learn from that. What's the reason? So that you yourself don't have to spend your life repeating the same mistakes that other people had made and not knowing, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Then you just look at other people's lives and that, that are recorded in the Bible and see how it turned out for them. And then we can see that's not a route or a path that I want to go down myself. So right here is a perfect example of this, of someone that did not learn from someone else's mistake. Look here in Genesis chapter number 20, verse number 1. We're just going to get the context because we touched on all this recently. Genesis chapter number 20, verse number 1. It says, And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife, and so forth and so forth. Of course, we're very familiar with the story and what took place here, but we see that Abraham himself ended up traveling here, and he went to it's, it, uh, into Gerar is where he traveled to, and Abimelech, who's the king of that land, ended up taking Abraham's wife, because, as a result of Abraham lying and saying that it was his sister. Now, obviously, it's a very wicked thing that Abraham did, the lie. But not only that, he almost put his wife into a position where she would have committed adultery on him. This is a major sin. It's not something to just, you know, to blow over or, or to just to look over. No, it's a major, major sin. And I want you to turn now with that in mind to Genesis 26. Just a few chapters later, Genesis chapter number 26, again, the very beginning of the chapter, we'll look at verse number 6. It says this, And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Now, does that sound familiar? And Isaac dwelt in Gerar, and the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, She is my sister, for he feared to say, She is my wife. Lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me, for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. And it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of the window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, 
his wife. Verse 9, And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety, she is thy wife. And how sayest thou, she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, lest I die for her. Now, if you uh, would like to take time after the service and look this passage up, compare Genesis 20 to Genesis 26, they are identical. They go to the same exact location. They, the, their motive for lying is exactly the same when you read, particularly in the scriptures. The situations are exactly the same. It's the exact same deceit or lie that's given to Abimelech. And then Abimelech ends up finding out himself and not from Abraham. He ends up finding out himself and not from Isaac. So what, what can we learn from this? Learn from other people's mistakes so that you don't have to repeat them yourself. Now, we don't know the whole situation, the whole nitty-gritty details. Oftentimes, the Bible will just give you the overview or just a general, concise you know, explanation of what takes place in situations like this. So we don't know if, if anything else went on. Obviously, we know that they didn't touch him, but whether or not Abraham was punished for this in another area of his life is what I'm getting at, or whether or not Isaac was punished for this in another area of his life. But let me say this. The Bible is very clear that you being a Christian, you if you're not punished from God for the sins that you commit, then you're a bastard and you're not a son in the first place. So I can promise you that if you want to live a life of sin, if you want to go out these doors and go out there and live a wicked life, God will punish you if you're saved. God will punish you if you're a Christian, 100%. So I don't know what particularly happened here. There are, there are, there are times, of course, where God will show mercy. But in your life in general, you will be punished by God many times for the sins that you commit. God can show mercy and still punish you, like with David. David received mercy. The Bible says David received mercy because David was supposed to be put to death. But that doesn't mean he wasn't punished at all because his son died. You might receive mercy, but you still might be punished also at the same exact time because you don't receive the full recompense of your reward. You're not receiving the full punishment. God gives you, excuse me, a lesser punishment. Now... Looking at what happened with Abraham and Isaac, we see, number one, we saw an ideal example of someone repeating their, their mistakes with Jehoshaphat. An ideal example of that where he's rebuked, he almost died, he almost you know, received a punishment for his stupid mistakes. Then we have another example here of where not the same person is repeating the same mistake. We have an example here of where Abraham commits a sin. He lies and he almost causes his wife to commit adultery. And then, you know, generations later, years later, not sure exactly how long particularly, but his son ends up committing the same exact mistake. Now, like I said, we don't know the punishment that he received or that he could have received, but we as Christians will be punished in our Christian lives. So what we need to do is we need to, when we commit a mistake, when we commit a sin or an error in our lives, we need to go forth and we need to correct that error. It would be best if when, when we commit, when you know, we're living our lives and making decisions, that we can look in the Bible for examples of, of other people committing sins, other people you know, committing mistakes, and not repeat those mistakes and learn from their example themselves. That's what I'm going to be preaching about this morning. I want you to turn with me to Proverbs chapter number 26. Proverbs chapter number 26. We're going to look at the folly, the folly and the foolishness of someone that repeats the same mistakes. Proverbs chapter number 26 of how stupid that it is when you, you, you commit this one sin, years go by, you receive the punishment for it, you receive whatever the recompense was, and then you go back and commit that exact same sin again. Just the folly and the foolishness and the pity of doing so. Look at... Proverbs 26, I want you to look at verse number 11. It says this, As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Now that is a very graphic description. That is a very graphic picture that is illustrated and painted in your mind. And it says, As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool, in the same way that saying, a fool returns to to his folly. So it's saying that a foolish person or a person that makes an even foolish decision, right? That would be a fool. Makes a foolish decision. It's the same. When that person goes back and commits that same foolish decision again, or they go back and, 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 and decide to make that same stupid decision again, it's, it, it's parallel or equivalent to 
A dog eating his vomit. Does it taste good, even for the dog? No, it's disgusting. Don't think that that just tastes good to the dog. That's not the reason why he does it, right? So he goes and he eats his vomit, right? And then he leaves. And then he goes back, and guess what? It tastes just as bad the second time. It's just as nasty and as unsanitary as it was the first time that he went back and he ate his own puke or vomit, whatever you want to refer to it as. It's disgusting, isn't it? Yeah. But saying it's just as stupid. When you commit a sin in your life, and then you decide, hey, you know what? I'm going to go back and do the same thing again. You know what you're like? You're like a dog going back to his puke the second time to eat it. That's what the Bible's teaching. You're like a dog that went back and ate his vomit the first time, and it was disgusting, and then he's so foolish and so stupid to go back and, hey, let's try this and see how this works out. It's going to taste the same. It's going to be the same results as it was the first time. I want you to go now to 2 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 22. I'm going to see this quoted again in the New Testament. 2 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 22. We're going to look at it quoted in the New Testament, and then we're going to look at an example of a very foolish man who did just this. He committed a sin, and then he went back and repeated the same sin repeatedly, over and over and over again. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 22, it's just, it's just quoting where we just read Proverbs. It says this, But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is returned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Of course, that is the life that a sow is referring to a pig, right? The life of a pig. That's what they live is a very dirty, disgusting life. And they're taken, and they're cleaned off, and they're washed, but then what do they do? They go back and they just get dirty again, dirty and disgusting again, right? That's a picture of a person that lives in sin or that is even a Christian and goes out and commits a sin, they return from that. They realize that it's wrong. They realize that they shouldn't have done what they did, but then they're so stupid to go around and roll around in the pig pen all over again. They're so dumb that they think that the vomit's going to taste a little bit better the second time around. It's foolishness. It's why they're referred to as a fool when he returns to his folly. Referring to the sin. Now I want you to go back to uh, the Old Testament again to Exodus chapter number 7. Exodus chapter number 7. Exodus chapter number 7. We have the story when Moses and Aaron confront uh, Pharaoh here. This is what we're going to look at. Exodus chapter number 7. Moses confronts Pharaoh and he commands him, of course, in the name of the Lord to let or to free the children of Israel, to let them go, right? And he goes to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh, of course, does not listen. Pharaoh mocks him. He goes there and he even performs a sign before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh, uh, he, he, his, his um, you know, uh, magicians are able to be able to do this, of course, from the devil. They're, they're able to do particular miracles, just like we see uh, Moses and Aaron performing these particular miracles. We can see that they do that. Uh, we're not going to read down through there. We will pick up. Let's look at verse number 13. I do want to pick up in verse number uh uh, 13 here at the very end, after uh, Aaron's rod is swallowed up by their rod. It says this in verse 13. And Aaron's rod swallowed up. I'm sorry, Aaron's rod swallowed up their rod. Verse 13. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. Verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuseth to let the people go. Get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning, lo, he goeth out into the water, and thou shalt stand by the river's brink against he come. It means until he comes. And the rod which was turned to a serpent shalt thou take in thine hand, and thou shalt say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, hitherto thou wouldest not hear. Thus saith the Lord, In this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in my hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. Then he goes on and on and talks about how everything is going to die in rivers. And this is not just the rivers. If you read this story, if you're familiar with the story, it's the ponds, it says. It's the streams. It's the vessels that, that the water is inside. Literally his entire land. All the water that is within his land. Can you imagine that? All of the water turns into blood. All of it. 
Not only that, Egypt is surrounded by much water, right? There's great rivers that are there, right? And all of the rivers are filled with blood, and everything that's in the rivers die. This is a major punishment, isn't it, from God for not listening to him? It's a major punishment. Imagine living at your house and wanting just, just to have a drink of water, and then you go in there and you go to get the water, and it's just filled with blood. I mean, it's not going to smell good, number one, but that, there's nothing to drink. There's nothing for you to consume to stay, dehydrated, to stay hydrated, and this is a major punishment, so don't ever look that. I want you to look now at verse number 22. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house, neither did he set his heart to this also. And all the Egyptians did round about the river for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the river. And seven days were fulfilled after that the Lord had smitten the river. Now I want to keep reading here. It's going to spill over into chapter number 8. Look at verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs, and the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house, and into thy, cha into thy bedchamber, and upon thy bed, and into the house of thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thine ovens, and into thy kneading troughs. So this is a plague of frogs. This isn't just a few frogs that are jumping around. It would be like this entire auditorium just filled with frogs, just everywhere. You can't step without stepping on a frog. They're all in your food. They're in your refrigerator. They are literally everywhere. Everywhere. It is a plague of frogs. So it's not something all it's frogs. No. It's a plague of frogs. Look at verse number... Four, and the frogs shall come up both on thee and upon thy people and upon all thy servants. So imagine sleeping at night and frogs are just all over you. They're just all, all night just jumping all over you. Can you imagine that? Now I know Mrs. Bobs has you know this terrible uh, fear of frogs, but I'm not afraid of frogs and I don't want frogs jumping all over me at night. I had those stupid, uh, uh, what are those, 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 those outside bugs, roaches called? What are those bugs called that fly around are massive? Palmetto the palmetto bugs. I had two of those things within a, within a month crawling on my face at night. I'm not kidding you. Where I woke up and there's a big stinking bug. I can feel a bug on my face. So I'm smacking myself in the face. Wake up, flip the light on, and I'm looking around everywhere. Jessica's like, just go back to bed. I'm like, I am killing that thing. That is not happening again. And I'm searched for it for like 10 minutes. Literally like a month and a half later. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. And I woke up and did the same thing. I hunted that thing down and it ended up being in our closet. It came out of our closet right when we were getting ready to go to sleep. And he's dead, and he's dead now for sure. Imagine having just frogs all over you at night. Just just jumping on you constantly throughout the night. It's a plague of frogs. It's horrible. Sometimes you look at these things and you're like, it's not that bad, it's frogs. No, it's it's a plague of frogs. It's terrible. In your food, everywhere, all the time. Look at uh, verse number 6. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. So notice that even, so I've heard people say, oh, they're just, uh, you know, they're just like, it's like the sleight of hand. Who's heard this? I've heard this like 50 times. That is not what's happening. Explain to me the sleight of hand where the magicians are going forth and they're bringing forth with their rod and summoning frogs, bring, and they're coming up all over covering the land. That's not what's happening. That is not what's going on. It tells you the magicians did so. You know what that means? They're doing the same thing. They're doing the exact same thing. That's why there comes a point where they're not able to do this, because obviously God, you know, the, the things that the Satan and the devil is, is able to do, there's an extent to it. God allows them to be able to do it. Just like when Satan goes forth to, to punish Job, he, he gives him a, you know, a marker of which he's not, a, he's not able to cross of his, where his power ends, right? You know, to say that you don't think that the devil actually has power is, is complete foolishness. And explain to me how the false prophet calls down fire from heaven. I mean, he has power. You know, Satan, he's the god of this world. He's not powerless. 
That's a foolish idea that people will do, uh, of, you, know, you know, where they want to belittle Satan. Satan has a lot of power, and Satan's very dangerous. That's, he's walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So Satan has power. Don't discount or look down upon the power that, that, that uh, Satan has, because then that is when he'll destroy your life. That's why you need to be diligent, because he is a roaring lion. Understand that he is a roaring lion. Look at what it says next in verse number 8. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. So all these frogs are brought up on the land. Even the magicians are able to bring the, the frogs up to the land. But notice that they're obviously not able to remove them, are they? Because he's got to call Moses and Aaron to get rid of them. So he at this point actually does come to or, or has Moses and Aaron come to him. He calls for them. They come to him. And you see at least a tad bit of humility here, don't you? Where he's like, entreat the Lord. I'm sure that it was humbling for Pharaoh to, to call for Moses and Aaron. He's probably, I'm sure he's not wanting to call them there to say, okay, enough is enough. Just get these frogs out of here. I'm sure he thought about it for a long time. What was the purpose of the frogs in the first place? Because he was commanded by God, let my people go. Let Israel go. And he said, who is the Lord? that I should let his people go. I'm not, letting, I'm not letting anyone go. These are my slaves. These are my servants. They're staying with me. Saying, I'm the Lord, basically. I am God. He's saying there's no one above him, right? Who is the Lord? That's what he's saying, right? So he's mocking that concept. He's mocking that idea. And then God says, okay, well, here's punishment number one. We're going to turn all the waters into blood. He, he's like, you do the same thing. The magicians are able to duplicate the exact same thing, aren't they? And then it says that it hardens his heart. Why? Because he's like, that's not that special. That's not that big of a deal. The frogs come, which I'm sure was torment. It's not just frogs. It's complete. It's a plague of them. It's torment, right? And then his magicians are able to do the same thing. But guess what? Time went on, and he's like, man, we got to get rid of these frogs. You know, we can't live like this any longer. So he finally humbles himself to some degree, and he realizes, you know what? I Now I know who the Lord is. Pray to the Lord and get these frogs out of here. Get rid of them. He even says, read it one more time, entreat the Lord. It's like, it's, it's, it's like ask him in a very formal way. Entreat. Uh, you know, to entreat someone is like when the Bible uses the word pray, I pray thee. It's more of a formal, humble uh, form of saying to ask someone. So he says, entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. Keep reading, verse 9. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, glory over me, when shall I entreat for thee, and for thy servants, and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses, that they may re remain in the river only. And he said, tomorrow. And he said, be it according to thy word, that thou mayest know that there is none life unto the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from thee, and from thy houses, and from thy servants, and from thy people. They shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields. And then it says this, And they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. So notice, they, they end up dying, and they end up gathering them together. So they still have to gather them up afterwards. It says they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. So notice how there is still a lingering aspect of the punishment upon them, even after he's like, okay, entreat the Lord, it's done. Right? So how bad was it for the frogs to be there in the first place? Horrible. Terrible, right? But not only that, even afterwards, he still has the lingering effects of his sin in his life. And that can happen to, to all of us. You can make a bad decision and it will follow you for the rest of your life. You can make a poor decision when you're a teenager. You can make a poor decision when you're in your 20s, when you're in your 30s, and that sin will follow you forever. But you know what you need to do is learn from your mistakes. You need to learn from the mistakes that you made. You need to make sure that you don't commit the same mistakes. What's even better is learning from other people's mistakes. Now I want you to look at how Pharaoh reacts. Keep reading here. So they gather them together. They stay. Look at verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart 
and hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. So what did he promise that he was going to do? I'll allow the Lord to go sacrifice. I'll, I'll allow the children of Israel to go sacrifice to the Lord, didn't he? That's what he said he was going to do. Did he end up doing that? Is there, everyone here familiar with the word respite? You know what the word respite means? It means delay, right? Or it means that, that there is a, a point of intermission in something. And it's a very, it's an older word. If you ever read any older books and stuff, you'll see this word specifically being used when it's talking about uh, the time period before someone's executed. That's where this word used to be used very, very often, even an hour, even in, in, in older uh, English literature set in the American days. This word will be used when it's talking about a criminal that's being uh, held before he is put to death. If that is a time of respite. So right here, when it says respite, it is referring to specifically that there being a, a, a time period where there is no punishment. Where once the punishment is gone. That's very important to understand. That first off, we saw the water was turned into blood, which is horrific, right? It's terrible. They weren't able to drink of anything. Then, of course, his heart was hardened because his own magicians were able to do it. Then he takes, uh, Moses and Aaron, that is, uh, goes to Pharaoh and tells him, hey, we're going to bring frogs upon the land. Don't let the people go. They, he doesn't let the people go. He sends frogs, just a plague of frogs upon the land. What happens? Pharaoh, of course, gets his magicians to do it, but then they won't leave. So he calls for Moses and Aaron, and he looks like, hey, I've learned my lesson. I realize what happened. I was wrong, right? Just please, please get these frogs out of here, and I'll let you guys go. Do you know when Pharaoh's mind changed? When the humility left, and when he went right back to his old ways, was as soon as, as, soon as there was respite. That's important to understand in your own personal life. Because everyone wants to be humble. Everyone feels like they've learned their lesson as soon as, while the punishment's coming. That's the time period when everyone's like, I'm never doing this again. I'm never going to make the same mistake again. Now, you may not be a pharaoh, and you may not be some wicked, hard-hearted God-hater that's just like, you know, uh, uh, blatantly refusing to obey the commandments of the Lord. But mankind is mankind, and this is how everyone is. People, re people make bad decisions, and what they end up doing is they make this bad decision, and if they receive the punishment immediately, which this doesn't always happen, but if they receive the punishment immediately, 99.9% .9 of people, even people that would be considered like reprobate, as Pharaoh is here, immediately they don't enjoy the punishment, do they? So they say, hey, I'm not doing it again. I'm not going to make a stupid decision like that again, right? You know what happens is, when there's respite, when the punishment's gone, once the, all the frogs are out of the land, once all the frogs are put into heaps, and then they rot, and then they don't smell bad anymore, he receives a little bit of respite, and what? He goes right back to his old ways. It's a perfect picture of the dog returning back to his vomit. So does the fool return to his folly. How stupid of a decision was it in the first place? I mean, you know, once he saw... Moses and Aaron, can you imagine? I mean, put yourself, you know, you need to, you need to put your mind into the Bible and, and, and believe the words that, are, that, it, and, and, uh, that it's describing and actually picture these things taking place. Can you imagine being Pharaoh yourself and having this man come to you? You know, it's Moses, of course, who he's familiar with. And he comes to him and he tells him, hey, let my people go, the Lord said. And he's like, who is the Lord? I'm not letting your people go. And he's like, well, here's a sign from the Lord. And he takes a rod and he turns that thing into a serpent in front of your own eyes. And it really turned into a serpent. Can you imagine seeing something like that? And he's like, I'm not doing it. Now, now you'd have to be an idiot at that, at that point even to say, I'm still not letting him go. You'd have to be a complete fool. But once the punishments start coming, because that's not, that's not a necessarily you know, a, a, a severe you know, uh, punishment that's coming down on him, is it? But once we see all the water being turned into blood, once we see the frogs coming into the land, and then his life is just becoming miserable, his life is just becoming where he's to the point of where he's unhappy, it's just complete misery. Everyone at that point is like, hey, you know, I've had enough. Pharaoh's like, hey, I've had enough. 
But what causes the person to go back to their old ways is oftentimes the heart being hardened after the punishment's gone. What causes the heart, what causes the person to, to, in the first place, to go to God and entreat the Lord? Humility. That's what it is. I want you to see this repeatedly. Look here at verse number, I want you to go over to the next chapter. Exodus chapter number 9. So the lice come uh, is, the, is the next plague after the frogs. So I want you to see this happen again in, in Exodus chapter number 9. Um, let's look at... Look at verse, verse 25 of where the hail. Let's read about the hail. So the frog, if, if, if you read about, the, in particular, all of the plagues that come, the ten plagues, they, the plagues get worse and they get worse and they get worse. I don't know if you've noticed that as time goes on. They're more, they're more negatively impacting it as, as it goes on, as each plague comes. They're negatively impacting the, uh, the lives of those that live in Egypt, worse and worse and worse. So the point now we're, we're, we're where the hail is. What's the last one? Does anyone remember what the last one is? The death of their firstborn son obviously is the most severe, isn't it? But it's getting worse and worse. At this point, God's causing hail to be, you know, uh, hail coming down, raining from heaven. Just Can you imagine something like that? It's just It's very similar to the plague that's going to be coming in the end times, where, you know, these huge, you know, just blocks of hail are just falling down, literally taking people's heads off, destroying their homes. It's terrible. Look at verse number uh, 25 that I said. And the hail smoked throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail smote every herb of the field and break every tree of the field. This is their livestock. This is their food. They didn't have a grocery store that they went to. All of their food is being destroyed. They have nothing to eat. I'm sure people, as a result of this, starved and died because they had nothing to eat. Look at what it says next. Verse 26. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time. So notice what he said. I have sinned. I have committed a sin. I realize it. I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. That sounds pretty humble, doesn't it? The Lord's righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Entreat the Lord, for it is enough. Say, I've had enough. That there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. And Moses said unto him, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto the Lord, and the thunder shall cease, neither shall there be any more heat, hail. That thou, that thou mayest know how that the earth is the Lord's. But as for thee and thy servants, I know that ye will not yet fear the Lord God. And the flax and the barley was smitten, for the barley was in the ear and the flax was bold. But the wheat and the rye were not smitten, for they were not grown up. And Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread abroad his hands unto the Lord. And the thunders and hail ceased. You know what that represents? The sin, again, the, the punishments of sin stopping. Now, like I said, sometimes the punishment will follow you for the rest of your life, and it never goes away. Sometimes the decisions you make will be there forever, right? I talked about some men's sins are open beforehand, and others they follow after. Some are very obvious, right? But some are not so obvious. Sometimes when you, call, when you make a sin or you commit a sin or make a mistake in your life, there will be a punishment initially, and it will only last for what? A month, two months, right? If you, let's say that someone made a bad decision at their job. They did something stupid at their job, and they end up being fired. Well, it's very possible that you could go get another job. God doesn't punish you on top of the inherent, the inherent punishment that comes with that. If, if you don't have any other consequences, you could go find another job, and you could do well at that job, right? You could, you could thrive and prosper at that job, right? Well, your punishment's over at that point if God isn't going to add anything additional to that, right? It's gone, but you can keep moving on. That's how most sin is in our life. Most sin, it's not where we're going to receive a punishment the rest of our life. Most sin, it's you, you commit this sin, and then you have a punishment initially, and then it's gone. And you know what oftentimes the, the response is from people? Very often, extremely often, Christians. It's where they commit the sin, 
And then after they will commit this sin, they receive the punishment, once there's respite, then they'll start considering making that same decision again. They'll start considering to, hey, maybe I'll go down that path one more time. Look at what it says. Verse number 34, when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, neither would he let the children of Israel go as the Lord had spoken by Moses. Notice what it said, that when he saw that the hail and the thunders had ceased, it says that he sinned yet more. Sinned yet the more. You notice that? That's, that is a picture of the Christian life. This is not just something that is, of course this is extremely blatant, where he just says, I'm not letting the people go. Of course, you know, this is, this is an extreme example uh, of someone, you know, and of course a reprobate, to the point of where he hates God, he hates the Lord, his heart is hardened by the Lord, right, purposely, where God is raising him up just so that he can destroy him. That's exactly what's explained where it says that in Romans chapter 2, when it's talking about these people, it says that they're storing up, they're treasuring up the wrath of God upon themselves against the day of wrath, you know, and his judgment. So this is an extreme example, but there, on a minor level, people make these, do these exact same things. You know what it is? It's the fool returning back to his folly. It's the dog eating the vomit, and then he goes back to that same vomit again. What's the reason why? This is, this is very key. This is, people convince themselves. Sin is enticing. There's no question about that. Sin is enticing. The Bible says there is pleasure in sin for a season. So to have this overly pious attitude, to say, oh, sin's not even enticing. That's foolish and that's not even Bible. Okay? The Bible teaches that sin is enticing. Right? The Bible refers to it, uses the word actually enticing repeatedly. It's, it, that's what lust means. That's what the word means. So when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Right? And when sin hath conceived, it bringeth forth death. So sin is enticing. And what will happen is a person will be enticed or tempted by sin. They'll look down that path and they'll go and they'll make that bad decision. If God ends up punishing them immediately, how does everyone act while they're in the midst of their punishment? While their punishment's going on, the Bible says that while we're being punished, you know, it's not pleasurable. It talks about it in Hebrews. Hebrews 12. You know, while you're receiving the punishment, no one enjoys it, right? So, of course, it's not fun then, right? But when the punishment goes away, when the thunders and the hail cease, when all the frogs are moved out of the land, oftentimes at the moment of respite, People look back, and the sin doesn't stop being enticing. It's just as enticing as it was the first time it lured you in. So they look back, or they see that same exact sin again. They look back, and they see that exact same temptation again, and it starts to draw them in again. You know what they do? They completely forget. They completely stop thinking about the punishment that they had received. And oftentimes... A lot more often than people want to admit, a lot more often than maybe you even think, many Christians sin yet the more. And they go back to the exact same sin that they had. Here's the thing. Like I said, the vomit doesn't taste any better the second time. And what, what people do is they go there and they commit that sin and they receive the punishment. But then after it's all said and done... They're enticed once more, and then they somehow convince themselves that, hey, it's going to be different this time. What, you know, I'm only going I'm only going to, this is how people justify things in their mind. I'm only going to do half of what I did last time. And of course, you know, this can apply in different other areas of what it may be. Or I'm not going to go as far as I had planned on going last time. Or I'm not going to, I'm not going to make exactly the same decision. I'm gonna, just going to do this. If you have to sit there and reason something in your mind like that, you need to stop right then, reanalyze the situation, clear your head, and most likely it's a bad decision. If you're having to, to stop and, 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 and say to yourself and to justify things to yourself, to where you're trying to talk yourself out of the situation or talk yourself into the situation of, hey, it's not going to be as bad this time, you're probably making a bad decision. At that moment, you should stop what you're doing and you should reanalyze what's going on. 
That's like uh, the people often say, and of course this is not like a, a, a medical dictionary definition, but people often say that the that the uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. Has anyone ever heard that before? You know, that's something that people will say on the job site constantly. If I watch somebody take a, a bolt and a nut and they try something repeatedly and it doesn't fit, I'll say to that person, Do you, have you ever heard of what the definition of a crazy person or of insanity is? You know, it's trying the same thing repeatedly and expecting afterwards, the second time or the third time, to get different results. This is a perfect application to a person that sins a sin in their life and they make a mistake in their life and they have an error in their life. They make a stupid, foolish decision. They receive the punishment, but then afterwards they think, hey, I'm going to go back to the vomit and maybe it'll taste a little bit better this time. Hey, I'm going to go back to the mud or the mire and maybe it won't be as nasty or as dirty. It's going to be just as bad, and the punishments and the consequences are going to be just as bad. And oftentimes, as a Christian, they're going to be worse. So if you want to step out into sin, and you've made this exact same error in your life, or mistake in your life, oftentimes, you only get a couple opportunities to do so, and the punishments, as the plagues did for Pharaoh, get worse and worse and worse. I want you to go to John chapter 5. I'm going to uh, switch gears here, and you'll see this in the Christian life where this is spoken of. John chapter number 5. John chapter number 5. John chapter number 5. We'll look at, uh, we'll begin uh, in verse number 5. It says, And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years, when Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case. He saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The evident man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another stepped down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole. So we can see this infirmity was something that caused him to be lame. He was not able to walk. And it says, and uh, walking on the same day was the Sabbath. Verse 10, keep reading. The Jews therefore said unto him, that was cured, it is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, he that made me whole, the same said unto me, take up thy bed <coughs> and walk. Then asked they him, what man is that which said unto thee, take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Verse 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come, come unto thee. So this is the exact opposite, obviously, of what it said about Pharaoh. It said he sinned yet the more. Jesus gives him a commandment here. And he gives him an admonition. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. Now, there's a couple of things uh, we can learn from this. Number one, obviously, don't be, don't have the mindset that he's telling him, hey, don't ever sin again. Don't. That's not what this is teaching. Paul says when he writes in in uh, Romans chapter number seven, he says, "O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death?" Paul says that you know, even at that time, while he's writing the book of Romans. Paul, who's probably the greatest Christian in the New Testament, says that he still does the things that he doesn't want to do, and he doesn't do the things that he does want to do. Jesus is not telling him, hey, go forth and live your life and never sin again. We will even talk like this ourselves, you know, oftentimes, where we'll say, hey, we need to live a clean life. Now, from the perspective of no sin at all, do you are you honest enough or, or, or dishonest enough to tell me that you live a clean life? If we're gonna, Because it depends on what standard we're talking about here. There's the standard of perfection the Bible will speak of, you know, being sinless, right? Not in the, the perfection of being whole and perfect, but the, the standard of sinlessness. Does anyone do that? You sin every day repeatedly, right? There's no one that does that. So the Bible is very clear. We're all sinners. We're all going to continue to be sinners. You know, there's, there's no point in anyone's life where anyone arrives and they never sin again. No one can say, I'll my life. Not a single person, right? 
So there, there are oftentimes uh, uh, examples in the Bible where we'll talk about a person living a righteous life, but it's not saying that they lived a sinless life. It's kind of like when it says about the kings that they did that which was right in, in the eyes of the Lord. They did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But they'll still have sin, won't they? Because it'll make, nevertheless, they did this, this, and that. It's saying overall they're not living an extremely just, just a wicked, blatant, disobedient life to God. We know by looking by reading the entire Bible and looking at this example here, we're very clear, you know, it's very clear he's not telling him, hey, go and just never sin another sin, sin again. Obviously, you should strive not to sin. But he tells him after that, to prove that's not what he's saying, he says right after that, lest a worse thing come upon thee, or come unto thee, right? So what does he mean by that, lest a worse thing come unto thee? You hear you know, oftentimes a lot of people that, that, that try to teach sinless perfection, they will, this is why I'm, I'm hitting on this right now, they'll say, oh, this is talking about hell. That is a total misappropriation. I'll tell you why, how you can prove that. What, what, was it, what is it comparing it unto? What did he have before? A physical infirmity. You know what he's saying? He's, he's comparing it unto that, saying a worse thing than that will come unto you. saying you'll be punished in that manner the same way, but it would be worse, right? It could, it would be, it's physical. The punishments that he's comparing unto is physical. Possibly it could be death even. But so I just wanted to hit on that for a minute because this is an abuse passage I've heard many times by Lordship, lordship salvationists and things like that. He's not, of course, foolishness to say you can never sin again. That's stupid. Number one. Number two, he's saying, lest the worst thing come unto thee, another punishment like that, but worse. That's what he's comparing it to. It's, it's, read it in context and understand what it's actually saying. I want you to turn with that in mind to Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter number 10. Because the Bible warns, and this is actually a common warning over and over again, about a Christian. Once a Christian is saved, uh, once a person is saved and they become a Christian in the first place, they've made you know, uh, uh, bad decisions in their life, they've committed sins in their life, and then going back to those same exact sins, that the punishment gets worse and worse as time goes on. Just like we saw there when God is speaking to, that's Jesus of course, he's speaking to the man that was lame, he tells him, hey, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. What's he telling him? What can we learn from that? If you continue to do these sins, if you continue maybe to, do, to commit a sin that brought a punishment upon you in the first place, what happens? The plagues get worse and worse and worse as they go. And you know where they often end? Very often, if you study your Bible, they end in death. Where did it end with the plagues of Pharaoh? Death. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 11, it talks about them taking communion, and some people are taking it unrighteously, and they, they need to judge themselves. You know, if they were to judge themselves, and they wouldn't be judged of the Lord, but when we're judged of God, we're chastened of the Lord. You know some of the punishments it mentions? In order, it talks about it being, you know, so for this cause, some are, si are, are, are sick, are sickly, and it says, and weak among you. And then you know what it says at the end? And then he sleeps. You know what that means? Death. You know what will happen if you just continue down the same path of sin? The end there of death. You'll end up dying. You'll end up, you know, receiving the punishment, the ultimate punishment from God where you can take your life. Look at Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter number 10, look at verse number 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. Now, that's not fire. Again, people that will say, oh, you lose your salvation and go to hell. No, no, no. Learn how to read. Reading comprehension skills are very important. It says fiery indignation. What's fiery is his anger. His anger is fiery, saying it's strong anger. Fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Saying it will destroy the adversaries. That proves that it's not referring specifically to a fire because devour is something that's talked about an animal doing. That's over and over again. Like, like I quoted earlier about the lion, lion, you know, walking about seeking whom he may devour. It's talking about an animal devouring something, eating something, destroying something. Keep reading there. It says, shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So notice the comparison here. 
Now he's now he's saying, what is what is he what is he warning you with right here? He gives you an example of someone, hey, this person died. Right? And then he says this in verse 29. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. Verse 30. For we know him that has said... The vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, recompense, saith the Lord. And again, notice what it says. The Lord shall judge his people. So this is clearly speaking of God judging his people. God judging the saved. It's a person that has received the spirit of grace and they turn. And what do they do? It says they've trodden underfoot the spirit of grace. It's talking about a person that... After they had received the knowledge of the truth, it's, it, it tells you that there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. So if a person decides that they're going to live willfully in sin, after they've you know, received the knowledge of the truth, they're saved, they obviously know that this is wrong, and they decide that they're going to live that exact same life, or go back to their vomit, or go back to maybe a sin of their past, or, or their own foolish, foolishness or folly... God is going to punish them. And he even used the example of the Old Testament. He even used an example of the Old Testament, and it's talking about when a man uh, it goes out and he picks up sticks. He's gathering sticks together. If you look this up, that's what it's quoting from there. He's gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And it says that he died without wit uh, witnesses, two or, two or three witnesses. Right? By the mouth of two or three witnesses. So this man ended up being put to death. So he compares it unto death. There's also another example in the Old Testament where it uses this exact same wording where it talks about someone despising the word of the Lord and despising the commandments. Does anybody know where it is? The commandment of God? This exact same phrase is used when David commits the sin with Bathsheba. Somebody look that up real quick and let's look at that. That's perfectly applicable. We're about to close the sermon right now. I want to look at that. Look that up. Somebody find that if you can, like on a Bible app or something. But it, it, it's it, this exact same statement. So for a person to say, oh, you know, um, you know, this is talking about someone that's going to lose their salvation. No, this is talking about the Lord judging his people. That's what it's talking about. This is talking about the Lord judging you know, those that are uh, uh, God's people and someone getting into sin and this, committing the same sin repeatedly. And you know what oftentimes it ends up being? Death. Now, in, in some cases, it's your own death. But in other cases, you know what ends up being? It's severe punishment. Maybe the death of your firstborn, like it was for Pharaoh. That's where his folly ended him. Anybody able to find it? It uses the word despise. It's not a big deal if you can't find it. Despise or despised. The law or the word of the Lord, I believe, is what Nathan said. It's when Nathan is speaking, it's when he's rebuking when he says, thou art the man, if you just look up that, that wording right there, you would find it. Uh, it's not that big of a deal. But either way, he's, he, what, it, what it is is it always ends, oftentimes, where your sin will, will lead you is death. It will either be your own death, possibly, or it will end up being possibly the death of maybe one of your children. It will possibly end up being the death of maybe your firstborn. It will possibly end up being the death of maybe you know your oldest son. I don't know, your oldest daughter. Whatever it may be. That's why it says, do you find it? Where is it at? Uh, 2 Samuel 12. 2 Samuel 12. Yeah. That exact phrase is there? Yeah. So this, this again, just because while I was referring to um, the Lordship salvations, will try to misapply this passage, and they'll say, oh, a person that despised the word of the Lord, a person that despised the law, these are unsaved people. Okay, well, let's look at an example here. You said 2 Samuel 12? Verse 9. Verse 9. Verse 9. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Now, is David, would anyone say, well, David's an unsaved man? David went to hell. David's just, you know, he's not a believer, right? That's foolishness. He, the Bible says that he, is, that, that he is the apple of God's eye, refers to him as, right? That he's a man after, you know, uh, he's a man for God's own heart. So even a Christian can despise the commandment of the Lord. And you know specifically when I talk about despising the commandment of the Lord? It's when you know full well what that commandment is, and then you just don't do it. The man that picked up sticks, 
on the Sabbath day? Was he ignorant? No, that's, it's referring to sinning willfully. Now, this is my point. This is what I'm about to close on. I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter number uh, 17. Or actually, you just go to 1 Kings, our very last passage. 1 Kings chapter number 22. 1 Kings chapter number 22, verse number 45. Now, sinning, what is the perfect example of sinning willfully? The perfect example of sinning willfully is someone that has sinned, and they even were punished for what they had done. And then they go back and they do it again. Now, willfully means that you wanted to do it or that you knew it and you made the decision. Well, the, the utter example of that is a person that commits a sin. They obviously know that it's wrong because they've been punished for it. And they've heard the commandment of God. And they clearly hear it in their minds. They've maybe even seen another example of it, right? They've seen someone else do it. But then they go and they decide to do the same thing again. Like I said... The vomit's not going to taste any different the second time that you go. And you know what you should do? There's many, many, many applications to this. And this is very, very important. Number one, you need to learn for yourself so that you don't end up making a decision. It's all games and, and things like that. And it's just this sermon's the same as every other sermon until in 20 years someone commits a grievous sin. Let me say this as well. Don't think that you're immune from these things. I can guarantee you that every single person in here. I feel very confident about this. If by reading the Bible and reading the stories of real lives, you have your own opinion, I'll have mine, but reading the, the stories of people in the Bible, every one of them in their lives, later in their lives, commit grievous sins. Do you hear me? Every person that I'm talking to right now will commit, going forward in their lives, from this point on, most likely a grievous sin. You, you want to hear my authority for that? basically every person that lives in the Bible. Every person. Moses, David, name me a man of God, and I can nine out of ten times show you a grievous sin they, that they committed in their lives. It doesn't matter who it is. Almost all of them make seriously bad decisions later in life. Even men that are exalted, that do great things, all of them virtually. All of them. Oftentimes the men that or end up being immune from these things are those that live set apart lives from the beginning, like a person like Jeremiah, a person like Paul, who from the very beginning are living these very humble, lowly lives. But most of the people in the Bible, the majority of the people in the Bible, commit very grievous sins in their adulthood. So most of the people that can hear my voice today are going to commit a very grievous sin in their life. And you know what happens is at that moment there's a fork in the road. Because mistakes after they're made need to be used for good because then you can use it as an example in your own life. Oftentimes you cannot learn from other people's examples. You should, but people don't. Let me word it that way. Because you don't feel the effects that they feel. That person can stand there and tell you till they're blue in the face, don't go down the same path as me. Parents say this all the time, right? But you don't understand until you make that same stupid decision and then you have the frogs all over your land or your firstborn dies, or something along those lines. How many people that went out and got drunk and, and killed somebody in an accident heard a million times, don't drink and drive, from a person who experienced it and maybe lost their family member? Or maybe a person that experienced it by killing someone else. But then what did they do? They went out and they did it again, didn't they? I'm sure you could find uh, repeat offenders on any type of subject like that, but most of the people that make a terribly bad decision like that Going forward, they probably correct that. They probably make sure that, hey, I'm not going to drink and drive in my life anymore. Many of them, you hear testimonies, they say, I don't drink at all anymore. You know why? Because it changed their life forever. Sometimes it's, you know, you receive that punishment and it follows you forever. But not all the time. And those some can, can be the most dangerous ones. You know why? Because you receive respite. Because you receive a little bit of a break or an intermission. And you think, oh, it's done. And this time when I go back, I'm going to dabble in it. I'm not going to fully go to where I was before. I'm not going to make the decision to the extent that I did before. I'm not going to, you know, put both feet in. I'm just going to dip my toes in. And you know what happens? A worse thing will come upon you. You'll receive a punishment even more. God judges those that have already made those bad decisions in the past. When they become a repeat offender, you don't receive the same punishment. That's not how it works. You receive a greater punishment. The flags get worse and worse and worse, and they always end in death. Every time. 
So don't think you're immune to this. Every person in here virtually will commit a grievous sin going forward in their lives today. I mean, God forbid, I hope that you don't. But reading the Bible, most of the people, most of the people in the Bible, they make terribly bad decisions later in their life. But don't, listen to me, this is the point. Don't be the fool that goes back to his folly. The vomit's not going to taste better the second time. It's still vomit. It may look good. I don't know how vomit looks good. But sin oftentimes is enticing. And it looks good, but it's deceitful. Right? It looks good, but it's manipulative is the point. But once you experience it, and you receive the punishment, don't be so dumb to go back and think that the end will be different. Don't be so stupid to go back and think, hey, things will work out differently this time. Maybe I can get off. Maybe I can get, you know, maybe I can get away, you know, without being punished too bad. Or last time the punishment wasn't horrible. People really get to the point where they sin is so manipulative in your mind that it will take you to the point where literally people will say, it's worth it. I wasn't punished that bad last time, but here's the thing. The punishments get worse, my friend. That's the reason why, because people have that mindset. Well, you know what, I realized that this happened last time, but hey, the frogs in the land, we're all still alive, right? Then the lice come, right? And then it, gets, it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. There's locusts that come, right? There's hail that comes. There's darkness upon the whole world. There's, you know, or upon the, all the land. There's the moraine. The plague upon all the animals, right? But you know what ends up happening? Then your firstborn son dies. Just continue down that path of sin, right? No one wants to get to that point, right? Look at 1 Kings chapter 22. We're going to end here for a perfect example. So we read about Jehoshaphat. These are parallel passages. That's where we started the story where Jehoshaphat made the bad decision, didn't he? To go with Ahab. Then Ahab dies in a war that he almost died with him. Because he made an affinity with him. And he still goes. After being rebuked for what he had done. He goes and he makes a league with the new king of uh, Israel. Because Jehoshaphat is the king of, of uh, Judah. So the new king of Israel is now is Ahaziah. And you know what happens is. He makes a league with him as well. And I want to focus on this right now. I, I meant to mention a little bit earlier, but the seriousness of what happened when all, all the ships, they invested all this money into these ships for, I'm sure, some sort of project. I mean, I know they were fighting wars and things like that, but either way, they, they intended on getting whatever the outcome was, I'm sure. They didn't put money in and expect you know, uh, to not get money back. Whatever the purpose was going to be, they were going to defend their land you know, and, and maybe take spoils from something. Whatever it was, they invested money into these ships. And what happened to the ships? They're all broken and destroyed. So that's a, that's a serious punishment too. I mean, imagine spending right now, imagine being you know, a man that has a business or something and spending $200,000 on something and then waking up one day and everything's destroyed and you don't have insurance. Can you imagine something like that? That's a big deal. You read stuff like this sometimes and you're like, ah. yeah, just $200,000 gone, you know? $250,000, a quarter of a million dollars. However much he spent on this, it was numerous ships for a, a battle to go forth. And God ended up breaking all of them. He, that's obvious. That's very clear. That's a punishment. So I want you to look here where this takes place. It's repeated again. Look at verse number 45. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and his might that he showed and how he warred, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And the remnant of the Sodomites, which remained in the, in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. There was then no king in Edom. A deputy was king. Jehoshaphat made ships of Tharshish to go to Ophir, to, uh, to go to Ophir for gold. Right there, there we receive the reason for it. I knew it was something lucrative, but I couldn't remember. But they went not, for the ships were broken at Ezion Geber. Verse 49, Then said Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, Unto, unto Jehoshaphat, let my servants go with thy servants in the ships. But then it says this, but Jehoshaphat would not. Now, it doesn't tell you specifically the reason. It doesn't tell you that he would not let them go because he learned his lesson, does it? I hope that that was the reason. 
I hope that once all the ships were destroyed and everything, when I read this, that's the way that I read it. You could say, oh, maybe there's not enough room, maybe this, maybe that, or maybe he wanted to get, his, get all the gold for himself. But when I read it, the way that I interpret it is, and this could be hopeful thinking, I interpreted that Jehoshaphat learned his lesson. Now, you know what would have been best? This is what really matters in the first place. You know what would have been best? If Jehoshaphat would have learned his lesson the first time, and none of this had to happen in, in the first place. Where Jehoshaphat didn't make the same mistake the first time. You know, of course, the, you know, God uh, uh, had, had, had already decided that he was going to lift up Pharaoh and harden his heart and destroy him. The Bible tells you that. But it would have been better hypothetically if Pharaoh would have learned the first time, wouldn't it? They end up crying out and saying, Are you gonna do even his own servants come to Pharaoh and say, You're destroying all of the land. You're killing everyone here. Does everyone remember that? When are you going to learn your lesson? Where all the servants are even coming to him, right? Do you know what would have been best for all the people of Egypt and Pharaoh himself if he would have learned the first time? You know what would have been best for Jehoshaphat? Learn the first time. Many times people don't. Now, here's a, one last application to this, and then I'm finished. You know one of the ways in which you can apply this? Abraham and Isaac. You, you want, number one, to learn from your own mistakes. If you make them, use them for the good and keep them in the forefront of your mind to help to remind you of the punishments. Oftentimes, it may be working. If I make a mistake when I'm putting something together, and let's say that it ends up being a bad mistake, right? And it causes you four or five hours to, to fix. When you go to do that again, what do you think about, right, when you're getting ready to put that together? Or fix something, or drill a hole, or whatever it may be. You know what pops into your mind? That mistake you made. And you, and you end up remembering that mistake for the rest of your life. Don't get to the point where you keep making mistakes. And the reason why it sticks in your mind is because it, it was a drastic punishment, in some sense, of a punishment. You made a major problem. If, you know, if you're drilling a hole and you drill through an electrical wire or something like that and blow something up. I know a guy in cable, you remember Bruce? Do you know about what he did? Yeah, he told me. He, he drilled a hole in, didn't check on the other side, caught the main 240 volt drop, and burned the house down. You think he ever walked? You think he didn't go inside and check the, the other side of the door the next time he went to go drill? If he's not, he might not be actually knowing this guy well. You know what he did? He went back to that vomit we thought it tasted a little better. That might be funny, but that's a big deal. Could have been a child in a room, and the mom was on the other side of the house and couldn't get to her kid to get him out of the house and kill the baby or something. I know that didn't happen in that case. But, you know, if a person does something like that and makes a stupid mistake the second time, they're a fool. The same mistake without checking or, or along those lines, if you, if you make that same decision, and the decision in that case is not looking and seeing, hey, what's here before I drill this hole, right? It's remembering the punishment from previously. Even when respite comes, you better keep that consequence in your mind. Remember how miserable you were and what the end is and what the wages will be. Because what happens is it's not going to be the same punishment. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. This was the point that I was about to make before I got off on that. This is what I would end on. At the very least, warn your children so that Isaac doesn't make the same mistake. Amen. If you make mistakes, they're gone. It's already done. Number one for yourself, don't repeat the mistakes. Don't be a Jehoshaphat. Don't be a Pharaoh. Don't be a fool that goes back to his vomit and his folly and to a pig, a sow to the to a wallowing in the mire. Don't go back and do it yourself. But you know what else? Use your mistakes for good after you make them and warn others. And say, Isaac, this it could have been real bad. Or maybe he did receive a punishment and he could tell Isaac, hey, this is what happened after that took place. Or hey, this is what almost happened. My wife almost committed adultery on me because of my stupid decision that I made. You, I don't want you to make the same decision. Warn your children. Maybe you made bad decisions growing up. Maybe you made bad decisions. Maybe even as a Christian in five years you make a bad decision. Hey, I hope that you don't, but once it's done, it's done. There's nothing you can do about it. At that point, you need to use it as an example. 
for yourself and don't repeat it. And then also explain to others, this is what happened to me and you don't want to do this. Be an example to others that other, hey, other people, hey, you don't want to repeat my mistakes. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for all the, the examples and the examples.